this story happened more than 10 years ago, when I was still a student. A bit of backstory, as with most students, I was always broke, and had a few ventures apart from my part-time job to bring me extra money. One of them was house and pet sitting. I have always had a love for animals, so when this couple contacted me to ask to house sit for them for the last few days before they returned from their overseas trip, as the last sitter had bailed on them, their six-month-old golden retriever puppy would be alone, I jumped at the opportunity. The fact that they promised to pay me the full two-week fee for staying there less than a week made it just more appealing. Little did I know how bad it would turn out. I got the details, got the keys from the agent and headed over to the house as it was already after 5pm and almost dark, as it was early spring. I got to the house, which was a really nice place, but it bordered on not such a good area that was and still is prone to crime house break-ins, robberies, etc. It didn't bother me much, because, you know, nothing will happen to me. I know. Young and naive. The first four nights went without a hitch. Watching movies, jacuzzi, and just generally enjoying myself. The owners would have returned on the fifth day fairly late at night. I went over to check on the doggo. I got a call from them at about 10pm saying their flight got delayed, they were going to stay in a hotel and do the three and a half hour drive back the following morning, and asked if I could sleep there again that night, which was fine. I was already there and had my overnight bag still in my car. I called my dad to let him know of my plans as I was still staying with my parents, and he specifically asked what the address was. I normally didn't give them details like that because I was old enough to look after myself, I thought. I still believe to this day that that probably saved my life. I eventually got to bed at 1am and it felt like I had only slept 5 minutes when I was awoken to a window breaking and I could hear movement and what sounded like footsteps running down the hall. The first thing I did was grab my phone and just hit redial. Thanks to my old Motorola phone, redialing was as simple as pressing one button as my dad was the last number that I had called hoping that he wakes up from the call. I then drop the phone in between the headboard and mattress in case my dad picks up that he can hear what is going on. I had barely done that when the first guy stormed through the bedroom door. I could see his silhouette, and he had a knife in his hand. When he saw me, he raised it and came at me. Now one thing to those that are unfamiliar with South Africa and the crime is that robberies and house invasions usually are very brutal and violent. People get murdered or tortured if they in the slightest retaliate or don't cooperate with the robbers. Out of instinct, I raised my legs back when he came at me and when he came within reach, I kick both legs out as hard as I can. Now I'm not a small guy, I'm 6 foot 3 and at that stage I weighed about 100 kilograms or 220 pounds and I was fit and strong. My time not spent at the university or work was at the gym. I could do an easy 250 pound bench, 350 pound squat. When I kicked and made contact with the guy, he completely lifted off the ground and shot into the wall. Luckily, the knife shot out of his hand as well. Before he got the chance to get up, I was on top of him, driving my right knee into his face and in return his head into the wall. I knew that my life depended on it, so I put in some extra force. The guy dropped like a sack of potatoes. But before I could get up, I heard the sound of a pistol cock and I froze. It felt like all the blood drained from my body and I became just numb. I remember the only thing that went through my head was that if he shot me that I would rather die than be disabled or dependent on other people that will have to take care of me. He stood like that with the pistol against my head for what felt like hours but was probably less than 10 seconds. I didn't move and he eventually said in very broken English to get on the bed face down. I panicked, but thought that if he wanted to shoot me that he already would have done so. So I did as he said. He threw a blanket over me and I turned into a fetal position with my back against the wall, just so that if they wanted to stab me that I'd have my legs and arms in front to protect my body. Now by that time I had forgotten that I had called my dad, and the guy that I had need is still down. I heard a third guy come into the room and I could hear what sounded like Portuguese to me. 
I couldn't understand what they said, but I recognized it as we used to go to Mozambique on holiday a lot and that is the main language spoken there. The one guy tried to get the guy that I put down off the ground while the other started to ransack the house, shoving valuables into a huge bag. It was about this time that I heard tires screeching and a car approaching at what sounded like Mach 1. The car skidded to a halt right in front of the gate and I heard someone scream. It was my dad. The three inside the house panicked and ran out of the back door and tried to jump the fence. My dad opened fire, shooting in their general direction. Now I know my dad missed them on purpose because if he wanted to hit them he would, as he's not just one of but the best shot that I know. And I'm not just saying that because he's my dad. He is ex-Special Forces, represented in South Africa in the Clay Pigeon World Championships a couple of years ago, has various regional pistol and rifle championship titles, and is a gunsmith by occupation. I have seen him hit golf balls at 50 meters with his pistol. I grabbed the house keys and pressed the gate remote, and my dad called the police while I came in. I met him at the front door, and we walked out to the car to wait there for the police. It took them over an hour to get there. Some excuse of no vehicle available. By that time, I had calmed down and started to look for the dog. I couldn't find her anywhere. I grabbed a flashlight from my dad and started scanning the surrounding yard, and as I got to the corner, I could see her laying on the ground. I got to her and saw that she had passed away. Later autopsies revealed that she was poisoned, and the police found pieces of meat laced with poison near the fence. Poisoning is pretty standard practice in my country for dealing with dogs at a house or area that is targeted for a break-in or robbery. I was fuming and so sad. The police were also pretty useless and had a don't-care attitude and barely took our statements. By that time, it was starting to get light and I retrieved my bag, phone, and locked the house as good as I can without touching anything and drove home behind my father. Only when I got home, I got the story from my dad's side. He said he answered my call, only to hear the shouting and what sounded like fighting going on, and when I didn't respond, he flew out of the house and raced over. Luckily, he asked for the address the previous night, and he knew the area well enough to know exactly which house it was. Now, my dad got there pretty quickly, and he said he stayed on the line the whole time, only hanging up when he stopped at the gate. My parents' house is about 10 kilometers or 6 miles from there, through a residential area. It normally took about 20 minutes of a drive, and the call duration was 7 minutes and 13 seconds. I met the detective there later that day, gave my statement, they took fingerprints, etc., and the owners got back about the same time. And the rest of the day was a blur, as I came down from the shock and adrenaline. Now, that is not where the story ends. About seven or eight months later, I got a call from the detective telling me they caught the guys and I must come to a lineup to point them out. I specifically told her that I didn't see any of their faces as it was dark and after the guy held the gun against my head, I was under the blanket and didn't see anything. She assured me that they caught them on fingerprints and will show them to me beforehand, which might not be the ethically correct way to do it, but they wanted to have as much evidence as possible against them and you will understand why in a minute. I got to the police station, and unlike you see in the movies, there is no one-way glass or separation room. They bring the three guys into the room and make them stand against the wall. The one, which I was later told was the leader, which was the one that I had need, looked at me with so much hate as I had never seen in my life. He had the eyes of someone that would slit your throat and not blink an eye. His name was Joseph Dragon Sambo. He pulled his hand up to his neck and made the slit my throat gesture. You know which one I mean. We left the room and the detective gave me a copy of his rap sheet. Amongst others, four counts of murder, I think eight to nine for attempted murder, multiple assaults, aggravated assault, over a hundred cases of house break-ins, robbery, and indecent assault against women. I was shocked. The detective told me that had I not taken him out first and fast that night, I would have definitely not gotten away so lightly. Now, this is also not where the story ends. Three days later, I get another call from the detective saying that I should be careful as 
He had escaped from custody and they had not caught him yet. I was not worried too much as the robbery wasn't at my house and I had changed cars so he probably couldn't find me. Also, I got my firearm license and carried my pistol on me 24-7. I didn't hear anything after that until about two years later when I saw the detective at the grocery store. We started talking about the case and she told me that he was killed during home invasion. He broke into the wrong house and the owner was waiting for him, pistol in hand, shot him once in the stomach and once in the neck, and thanks to the slow response time of emergency services and police, he bled out on the guy's living room floor, ridding society of a piece of human garbage. For a little backstory, the legal drinking age in my country is 18, so if you want alcohol and didn't have a fake ID or a parent to get it for you, then you had to wait outside of the off license, which is like a liquor store for the Americans, until someone came by who agreed to go in and purchase the alcohol for you. So we waited around, found someone who was willing to go in and buy our alcohol for us, and got him to purchase a few bottles of vodka for me and a few friends, two of which I was with and the other we were meeting after we'd done this. Now, as it was around 6 p.m., we decided it was too much of a risk to decant our vodka into a less suspicious-looking bottle in the middle of the street as it was very busy, so we did what we would usually do in the situation and found a nearby food place to quickly run in and use the bathroom to decant our alcohol so we could be on our merry way. This time, we chose to do this in a nearby McDonald's. We'd done it in before, so we knew it was a safe bet. So we go into the McDonald's and head straight for the bathroom, as we'd done a million times before. As we get into the bathroom, me and my other two friends, we'll call them Harriet and Kara, all occupy one cubicle to get the job done and get out and back to our drinking ASAP. And as I previously mentioned, we'd done this lots of times before and usually opted to come into this McDonald's as it was usually busy, which meant no one paid attention to three teenagers running straight to the toilet without purchasing anything. So anyway, we're all in there doing our thing when I could suddenly hear a lot of shifting and moving above us. I figured it was possibly the air conditioning and opted not to tell my friends as I thought it would freak them out. We get the job done and as we're about to leave the cubicle, we hear a giggle and a, where he girls off to. I looked up and see the forehead and eyes of a male who looked to be about 30, just staring out from underneath a tile in the ceiling that he'd slightly lifted. We're all in shock, just staring at this guy who proceeded to giggle down at us and ask our names, where we were going to and if he could come. We're all in shock because, let's be honest, who really expects there to be some random guy in the ceiling of a McDonald's? Being a teenager who thought I was untouchable, I proceeded to tell the guy that he was a perv and to F right off. The guy seemed to enjoy this and giggled a little more, still shifting around in the ceiling, never taking his eyes off of us. Now I should probably mention that along with pouring our drinks into other bottles, we pre-rolled a few joints so we were scared to alert anyone at this point as we were young and terrified of our parents finding out. The guy still staring at us proceeds to ask questions like, What age are you guys? Where do you live? Can I have some of your drink and smoke of your weed? Still all the while twitching and fidgeting overhead. He then started to lift the tile, and as we were all stuck in a cubicle with this guy above us, we knew the only way for him to get down was to come down directly on top of us. So we got out of there at that point pretty quickly. We went outside and discussed what we were going to do and I decided to go back in and alert someone as it's a very busy McDonald's and I knew that there would be women and children in and out of the toilets until closing time. I didn't want to risk that creep staying up there just to spy on them, especially since I knew he was there and had witnessed his behavior firsthand. So I go in, tell a member of staff that I'd been in the toilet for a long while talking on a phone call Terrible lie, but my 15 to 16 year old brain was too scared to tell the truth in case they alerted the police. And that's when the guy had appeared and, to my shock, they were completely unsurprised. They were just angry more than anything. I've seen a few male members of staff enter the toilet and I figured they could handle it from there so I went on my way. 
We still went into that McDonald's, but never had any encounters with that bathroom fairy. We're not even sure if the guy got caught, as we didn't hear anything about it afterwards. I was 20 years old, a female at an anime convention. My 21st birthday was coming up a month later, so my roommates decided to let me get completely wasted as long as I stayed in the room or left with someone I trusted. I was staying with a large group of people in one of their nicer hotel rooms there. I had been to quite a lot of conventions and never really had a bad experience outside of a few cosplay creepers and terrible people at times. The weekend went pretty normal except I was drunk and my group was throwing small parties. On the night of a particularly not so fun one, I decided to drunkenly leave the room and go roam around the main lobby. This was when I met Steven. I have no idea how old Steven was, but he was at least an adult, maybe a little older than me. We ran into each other at a manga table and he mentioned how he loved the manga that I was holding. I didn't really read manga and just liked the artwork. I'm an anime Andy, so to speak, but I still listen to him gush about the story for a few because whatever he seems nice enough. I didn't say much to him outside of, "Mm mm-hmm, and yeah, that sounds really cool. I thanked him for the info and walked away. After about an hour or so of roaming around, I decided to head back up to my room. Back in my room, I had taken two shots with my roomies and was laying on the couch when we got a knock on the door. The music and talking quieted down as it was customary to shush when someone knocked in case of con security coming to shut down our party. That's when my roommate who answered the door said, Veronica? Uh, yeah, she's here. Come on in. Followed by silence and then my roommate calling my name and telling me, Hey, someone's here for you. Now two things drunk me didn't think about were the fact that I didn't tell Stephen my name... Our interaction lasted five minutes max, and I gave no information to him. On top of that, my name is more complicated and hard to pronounce, but maybe I assumed he just described me and my roommate knew who he was talking about. But I didn't give him my room number. We were several floors up in the suites area. You'd have to take a different elevator to get to the room than you would to get to a standard hotel room. I definitely didn't think about that, though. I walked to the door, and Stephen was smiling. He asked me to go for a walk with him, and I drunkenly said yes. I mean, he's just an awkward anime dude who just wanted a friend to hang out with. Or so I thought. We were walking, and he was talking to me about how he recently was watching an anime where the protagonist wouldn't stop killing the girl he liked. I've since googled that anime plot and have not been able to find one similar to what he was talking about outside of some yandere anime. I got a little creeped out as the hall was empty and we were walking with no plan of where we were going. He then began to talk about his favorite serial killers, how he was a huge crime junkie and how he followed a lot of cases. A big red flag went off in my head and I decided it was time to try to go back to my room. But then he stopped walking and stared at me. I know a really cool spot we can go. If you take the staff elevator you can go all the way to the top of the hotel. It's really pretty. He was suddenly breathing a little oddly and his hands were shaking. I said no as I had some sense left in my head. He then grabbed my arm as hard as he could and started pulling me, yanking me towards the staff doors. I pulled back asking him to stop and he told me to just be quiet. I yanked free of him and started running. He chased after me telling me to stop. I was nearly in tears and wondering why the hallways were so empty at one of the most crowded cons I'd ever went to. When I finally ran into a group of girls, they saw the fear on my face and immediately pulled me into their group, asking me about my hair and makeup, wrapping their arms around me. I was crying, telling them what was happening, and when I looked back, Stephen was gone. I didn't see him for the rest of the con, but I stopped being so friendly at cons because of him. I would also like to say Stephen is the name I gave him. I never got his name personally. I told Con Security about him, and my roommates and friends used the buddy system with me for the rest of the convention. I truly, honestly believed, based on what he said and the way that he acted when I tried to get away, that he was planning to take me to that beautiful view and push me off. I 
I was 19, I'm now 22, and I worked in the mall in my town. My town is relatively calm, never have any major crimes committed, but the city that's about 15 minutes out used to have the highest murder rate in Canada. The mall I worked in was pretty small. The usual type of customers were moms with their kids or older people just trying to pass the time. Not a sketchy type of mall at all and very safe to work at. One day I was on my break and I went to the food court to get a drink and sit down and just browse my phone as usual. I noticed two women walking towards me and my first instinct was they saw my uniform and they were going to ask me something about a product my store sold. I thought nothing sinister of it. They come up to me and sit down right away. They both had heavy accents, though I'm not sure what kind because it hadn't been something I'd ever heard. They were dressed very classy as if they were going to church and they relatively seem completely normal. One of the women pulls out a book and they begin asking me some odd questions, such as, do you go to church? Do you believe in God? Mainly just stuff that has to do with religion, so I assume they were some sort of missionaries. They then began to tell me about God the Mother. With me being extremely shy, I just listened to them talk. They then asked me if I was able to come with them to a youth group that they had organized that was going on tonight. I told them that I was at work and just on break so I couldn't go, but they continued to insist. Finally, they got the message that I couldn't go with them, so they asked me for my phone number and told me that they'd text me next time they arranged one and I could go. I really didn't want to talk to them anymore. I wanted to get them to leave, so I agreed and gave them my phone number. A couple of days later, I got a text from them trying to arrange something, but I just blocked the number and thought nothing of it. It's not that I thought that they were planning to hurt me, I just wasn't really into going to a youth group. And then a couple of months later, I was reading the news and there was a story warning young girls about a human trafficking scheme in my city. It said that women would come up to you and talk to you about God the Mother and try to get you to leave with them. So thank goodness I hadn't finished my shift yet, and thank goodness that I never responded to their text. It's so weird to me to think that, if I would have, I probably wouldn't be in Canada right now. A couple of years ago, I flew home to visit family. I'd be there about a week, then we'd head to the coast for a week, then back home for another week. I totally needed this break. I had just ended an on-again, off-again relationship. Like seriously, one day on, the next day off, literally. It took seven months of putting up with it because you're supposed to fight for what is important to you, right? Anyhow, I finally just said I was done with it. No more chances, no trying to work it out, just done. So with that chapter of my life being over, I was more than happy to be somewhere else, surrounded by family and beginning to put myself back together. Got there, spent a couple of days sleeping a lot. My mother's a nurse and she was becoming concerned that there was something physically wrong with me. I just needed a couple of days in a safe place where I could let my brain work on digesting the new life I would have when I got back home. So before we left for the coast, I met up with a friend from grade school that I'd kept in contact with over the years. I thought it would just be he and I, but it didn't really faze me that another person was there. We hung out for a while and then I needed to head home because I had to take a backwoods rural route to get home or taking a different route that would add another 20 minutes on my trek. Being backwoods, I needed to be able to keep an eye out for deer. So I said my goodbyes and told the friend that if he was ever in my neck of the woods to look me up and we grab a drink and hang out. I told him to grab my number from my friend and out the door I went. About halfway home, I got this weird queasy feeling in the pit of my stomach, so I slowed way down and sure enough, there was a deer in the middle of the road. Because I had slowed down, I could see another car out in the road. I couldn't shake the queasy feeling, so I figured it would be better to cut off and go down to the main road because there were more places to stop. I seriously didn't want to stop in some rural farmer's driveway. I've watched too many movies to make that mistake. So I get over to the main road and pull into a gas station and sit there for a couple of minutes trying not to get sick to my stomach. I ran into the store, grabbed some water and ginger ale and came back to my vehicle, still unable to shake that queasy feeling. 
so I started to head home from the gas station and knew I didn't want to go straight home. So I drove around, taking this road or that road until that weird feeling started to go away. Then I went home, read for a bit, and then went to sleep. The next day everything was fine and we headed off to the coast. Fast forward two weeks, trip is over, I'm still feeling a little bit fragile over the breakup, but that's all. I figured I would begin the process of cleansing the environment of negative energies and then work through the baggage that came from the breakup. I knew that there was a lot and it would take time. So the next day I was going about my business and everything is as cool as it can be when picking through the junk left behind after a breakup. I'm really just doing mindless things to zone out and not have to think too much on the activities since my brain was working full time already. A little bit later in the day my phone rings. I don't get a lot of calls so I assumed that there might be a family emergency that I needed to answer it ASAP. The area code of the caller, who was not in my contacts, is the same as my cousin, so I answered without a second thought. On the other end was the acquaintance I met at my friend's house. It's a little weird to have him be calling me, but I'm not thinking that anything is terribly out of the ordinary. I asked him what was up, and he said he was at the airport. I still find it a little odd, but I said, Oh, that's cool, where are you going? He'd said that he'd already landed. Again, I'm distracted and really just want to get him off the phone so I could go back to my mental sidestep and zone out while my brain chugged away. So I said that I'd hoped he'd have a good time wherever he was. He said that he needed me to pick him up. What? Did you just say you needed me to pick you up? Yeah, he replied. I came to visit you. Pause there for a second. I know for a fact that I didn't show any more interest in him than general courtesy. Even the tossed over the shoulder look me up comment was one of those polite things to say because you never actually plan on seeing them again. Unpause. Why did you come to visit me? I asked. He said he felt a deep connection and wanted to be with me. I'm starting to get angry as well as freaked out at this stage. I told him I didn't feel connection at all and couldn't believe that he would fly across the country to see someone that he'd spent maybe two hours with. He said that I invited him when I said to look him up. I said, mm, no? That's just a polite thing to say to some random person that has made a very small impression on me. He said they needed to find a way back home then since I misled him. Misled? Look me up if you're ever in my neck of the woods had led him to think that was a basis for any sort of encounter that was meaningful? He said that he needed a place to stay until he could get the money for a plane ticket back. I said that there were more than enough hotels that he could stay at while he got himself sorted out. He said he didn't have any money after buying the random one-way plane ticket. So at this stage, I'm flabbergasted, angry, and freaked out that someone would do that on a one-way ticket. I finally caved and said he could stay the night while we sorted this out, but I expected him to be gone no later than the morning of the day after tomorrow. So I bring him back to my place, throw pillows and a blanket on the couch, and turn to head to my bedroom and he asks if he can sleep with me. I'm like, uh, no? Actually, no way is that going to happen. So I point out that I have firearms and do not attempt to come in. The next day I have work so I woke him up and told him to get up and find a way home immediately. I also told him that I had to work but would check in on his progress because the next morning I was dropping him off at departures regardless of whether he had a way back or not. Went to work. He blew up my phone all day. Wanted me to come back to my place for lunch. Told him no, I'm way too busy. I finally get home from work and I'm chuckling at a text that I got about my dog and that's when I noticed that he rearranged everything and by everything I mean every room of the house had been rearranged. I flipped my lid. I asked him why he thought it was normal to do anything that he did. Instead of answering, he asked me who I'd been talking to. I said it wasn't really any of his business but I had received a text from the guy watching my dog while I was on vacation. Color me shocked when he says that he doesn't want me to talk to that guy. No longer freaked, full force apocalyptic disaster is about to be unleashed and leave nothing but a smoking crater. The temperature drops about 10 degrees and I very calmly said to get his stuff, 
I was calling a cab to take him to the airport because he is a psycho. Side note, full rage has been achieved when it feels like the temperature drops and I speak very calmly. If I'm complaining about something, it's a quick burn. If I go monotone calm and tilt my head to one side slightly, this is where I hit arctic levels of anger. So he, unaware of the environmental change that has occurred and that the chances of survival are dropping by the second, decides to tell me that he used my computer and got my ex's phone number and they both agree that I was just heartless. We're fast approaching the epic scale disaster and he finally seems to notice how deep into rage I had sunk. I told him it was unlikely that he had gotten in my computer because it's a full quote of a part of The Art of War by Sun Tzu, and that he would have to have been the processing power of the Hadron Collider computers, and it was obvious that was not the case. I told him he had three minutes to get his stuff and get out, or I wouldn't be responsible for what would occur. So, still yelling insults at me, he gathers his stuff and leaves. I used to get calls and texts from him. I block one and six more would pop up, but it eventually stopped. To this day, I have no idea, nor interest in knowing where he's at, or if he made it back. I'm a French girl. I'm 25 years old, but I was 22 when it happened. I was living with my boyfriend, ex now, in a little flat in Paris. I was in a toxic and violent relationship. Moreover, I was suffering from a disease, so I couldn't go out with friends so I spent most of my free time on the internet. I didn't have many friends, I was really lonely, as I couldn't go out, most of them abandoned me when I fell sick. The few friends that I had were living really far away. One day, I had a big argument with my boyfriend. I was really sad and lonely, so I decided to chat with random people on a website. I met a guy, we had the same interests, we were both playing video games a lot. We talked for six months every day. He was knowing that I was in a relationship, even if it was a terrible one. We'll call him Alex. We decided to meet in real life. He was okay to meet me at my flat. At first, we were both really shy, but thanks to alcohol, we talked and laughed together. I was so relieved that finally I was having a friend to talk with. We were seeing each other at least once per week. I remember this as a happy time. We had so many common points and he never forced me to go out. He was really helping me, and I was helping him. He was a depressed guy. He was thinking that he was ruining his own life. I wanted to help him as much as I could to give him self-esteem. I just wanted him to spend good time with a good friend. And for my 22nd birthday, my boyfriend decided to make a party, and he invited Alex as he was my only friend that we were living not too far from my flat, and he invited 10 of his friends. I wasn't really happy with that. He knew that I didn't like when there's too many people. It tends to get me anxious and feel pressured. So I spent my entire night cooking and serving his friends. I really couldn't enjoy the party. And then my boyfriend humiliated me in front of everyone. and I went to the bathroom to cry. Alex joined me and tried his best to comfort me. And I was in a pure mental breakdown. So I told him everything about my boyfriend's behavior. I insisted on the fact that I loved him, but... I will break up when it will be the right time. It was too dangerous to break up at that moment. As I was crying, he tried to kiss me. I stopped him. I didn't want to add a new problem in my life. It was already too difficult. I know that it's weird to say, but I was feeling betrayed. I was feeling that he was waiting for this moment to try something. He didn't react, opened the door, and gave me a gift. It was a really beautiful necklace. I told him that I couldn't accept it. It was too expensive, but he went out without a word. After this, I decided to put some distance between us. I didn't want to make him suffer. It's cruel to keep him as a friend if he wants more. I explained to him that if he wanted more, it will not be with me. I didn't want to cheat on my boyfriend, but if one day he wanted to talk to a friend, then he could contact me. And I didn't hear from him after this. A few months later, I received texts from him. It was really long, something like 20 texts. He was saying that he was really in love with me, that he wanted to save me, that I was his reason to live. I was shocked at first, because the way he said it was really creepy. 
I explained to him one more time that I didn't need to be saved, that I was an adult and even if my boyfriend was mean, I didn't want to break up. I wasn't feeling ready for this and then I wasn't in love with him. We exchanged texts for more than one hour, but he didn't want to understand. Alex was insisting a lot. My boyfriend bugged as I was receiving too many texts and phone calls. It was making me too anxious. I decided to turn my phone off and went to work. At this moment, I was working in a little restaurant. I was a waitress there and I was taking commands by phone. The phone was ringing. I picked up the phone. I heard breathing at first, then I recognized the voice. It was Alex's voice. I was feeling like I was in a horror movie. My bones froze. My entire body was shaking. I hung up almost immediately, but the phone rang again, something like ten times until my boss picked it up. It was 7 p.m. I was supposed to finish my work at midnight. At 11 p.m. I saw him. He came to my workplace and begged to talk to me. I was so afraid I couldn't talk. I ran into the kitchen, explained the situation to one of my coworkers. He took my place as a waiter and I took his as a cook. Alex left 30 minutes later. I was too afraid to come home alone so my coworker dropped me off to my flat. My boyfriend was a night worker so I was alone. I locked my flat's door, blocked Alex's number and I was ready to call the police. I didn't want to talk about it to my boyfriend. I already knew that he wouldn't help me or that he would accuse me of being too provocative. Moreover, I didn't want him to fight with Alex. Alex to me was just lost. He didn't deserve to be beaten up by my boyfriend. The next day I had more than a hundred block calls. I didn't sleep at all. I was exhausted. I was trying not to give him any attention. A month passed. He tried to come to my workplace many times but my boss talked to him and called the cops. Then he never came back there. He was still harassing me but I was ignoring it. I thought that he'll understand and finally leave me alone. I was afraid so I tried to lodge a complaint with the police but they refused it as it was just a guy who's in love so to speak. One day I woke up to go to work. My boyfriend was playing online video games and he received a message. This was Alex. In the text he was saying that he was in love with me, that we had made love many times, that I was a cheater and stuff like that. I was shocked. I didn't understand what was happening. My brain froze and I couldn't react. But thank God my boyfriend saw my blocked call. He was suspecting that Alex was harassing me for a long time, even if I never told him. He decided to block him too, then he went to work. My boss called me, told me that I will begin two hours later today, and I was alone in my flat. I don't know how to explain it, but I was feeling that something would happen, and my heart was racing. I was feeling nauseous. Then I heard my doorbell ring. One time, two times, three times, ten times, I couldn't stand or walk. My entire body was freezing up. I was feeling the tears on my face, but I couldn't react. I felt all of this was just some nightmare. I waited as silently as possible. As he was stalking me for a long time, he knew that I was supposed to work at this hour. I thought that he wanted to see my boyfriend to manipulate him, as he wanted me to be single and that was the best way. The doorbell rang again. I was supposed to go to work. It took all my courage and I went out. It was him. He was crying. At this moment I wasn't afraid anymore. I was so angry and I began to shout at him. He was trying to explain that he was so in love with me. He would die if I didn't give him the chance. He said that he talked to my boyfriend, that he would finally save me, and that even if I don't want to be with him, my boyfriend would have to kill him so he wouldn't suffer anymore. Moreover, he admitted that he hacked my Facebook and Instagram account so he knew that I wasn't hating him. I talked about the situation to my best friend. I was saying to her that Alex was just unstable but not mean but that was more sad than angry about his behavior and stuff like that. I decided to run out, but he followed me and grabbed my arms when I was trying to escape by the stairs. I hit him. I begged him to let me go. I cried like I'd never in my entire life. I felt terrorized, angry. I just wanted to escape and run as far as possible. He pushed me against the door and told me these words. If you refuse to have a conversation with me, I'll go to your boyfriend's workplace. I'll talk to him, then he'll hate you as much as I love you. 
Maybe he'd kill me, but that doesn't matter. I was trapped. I couldn't escape. I didn't want to call the cops as they didn't help me at first. I decided to accept to have a conversation with him outside after my work. He calmed down instantly, thanked me, and went out. When I arrived at work, I was still shaking. I explained everything to my coworker and boss. My coworker decided to stay in his car after work in front of the restaurant so that if I needed help, he would be there. At the end of my shift, Alex was here. We sat outside and talked. He was repeating what he'd said to me a million times already, again and again. Then I interrupted him calmly and said that nothing will ever happen between us, that I was afraid of him and that he was poisoning my life. Moreover, he was putting me in danger. He stopped. It looked like he finally realized what he was doing. He pulled something out of his bag. It was a really big package, and he gave it to me. It was full of expensive items. I told him that I didn't want to accept it. At first he told me that he bought this for me so he couldn't keep it as it would be a reminder of me. Then he kind of blackmailed me by saying that if I accepted this, he won't contact me ever again. I accepted. I was tired, and I just wanted to go home and finally sleep. Then he said goodbye and went out. Sadly, that's not the end of the story. Two weeks later, I was sleeping at one of my co-worker's places who became one of my most precious friends, and at 5 a.m. I heard my phone ringing. I was too tired to answer, but I heard it again, and again, and again. It was some text from an unknown number. I opened it, and the first thing I saw was blood. Then there was a long text, but I didn't have the time to read it as I received other pictures. There was blood everywhere in the pictures. I woke up my friend. I showed her the pictures, and I was shaking so much I couldn't understand what was happening. I received 31 pictures of mutilated arms, torsos, and legs. On the last of them, I saw Alex's face. It was Alex again. I called Alex's mother to explain her what was happening, and I recognized his bedroom in the pictures. Then my friend put my phone far from me. She was hugging me, and I was feeling so guilty thinking that everything was my fault. Almost an hour later, I didn't receive another text or call which was making me even more anxious. I thought that he was dead. Suddenly my phone rang again. I received a video of him and he was in a hospital bed. He was trying to talk, but almost everything was unintelligible except for a few words like love and promises. Alex had tried to take his own life. He took drugs and cut himself. He was diagnosed as bipolar with a personality disorder. He stayed a few months at that psychiatric clinic. The last thing I heard about him was that he's on treatment and feeling better. I received a last text last year and it was just, sorry. Since this day I moved out. I have a new job, a new place to live, in a different city, and a different boyfriend. Even if I'm still traumatized by it, I do think that Alex isn't that bad of a guy. In France, psychiatric troubles are taken a little too lightly. Alex needed help, and I really hope from the bottom of my heart that he's gotten it. A couple of years ago, I, a 21-year-old female, was solo backpacking in France and made a day trip out to Versailles from Paris. You have to take two separate trains to both get out there and get back. I got on my first train heading back from Versailles and my phone was at 3%, so I had it on airplane mode and low power but had my headphones in without anything playing to deter people from approaching me. John didn't care. He came over and sat beside me, speaking to me in French. i have been walking around the gardens all day and wasn't really in the mood to entertain anyone, so I pretended I didn't understand French. He pulled out his phone and went onto Google Translate, asking if I wanted to learn French. I responded with, no, thank you, and went to put my headphones back in and appear even more uninterested since my body language wasn't enough for him. He continued to ask me questions through his phone, and the next one being, where are you sleeping? I lied and said that I was in a large hotel with my family and was heading back to them. He asked where it was, and all I replied with was, Paris. 
He then asked if I was getting off at a specific stop of the subway, which I said yes to, another lie, and he said that he'd go with me. I immediately said no and ended the conversation. I got my headphones in and completely closed him off from talking to me, which prompted him to leave me alone for a couple of minutes. He then got a phone call and said to his friend, yeah, I'll get off at X stop and you go to Y stop. This set off the danger danger alarm in my head because Y stop is the actual stop that I was getting off at. We got to the transfer station and he got up and off the train and waited for me at the doors. I took my sweet time getting up and made sure I had everything to the point that it was very obnoxious I was doing it on purpose. He then left to get on the other train and I slowly made my way off into the next train. I mean painfully slow. I got on the train at the very front and was watching everyone around me to make sure that nobody was being suspicious or watching me to the point that they all probably thought that I was on something. We got to X stop and I'm watching the people going off and coming on as well as anyone on the platform but I see no sign of him or anyone paying much attention to me. We get to Y stop and I get off with the crowd, turn the corner and he's there with four friends scanning everyone coming out. I turned around so fast and went the exact opposite way, taking my hair out of my bun and trying to change my appearance as much as I possibly could. As soon as I got out of the train, I ran back to my hostel and refused to leave it unless I was with one of my roommates. This happened to me two weeks ago. I started university in September and therefore live in a students only apartment complex. There are four other apartments in my hallway and sometimes we just spend time in each other's apartments. I had the absolute chance, that's ironic, to lose my keys the first week of university. It wasn't a big deal, I simply paid for another key. After a week in my apartment, I started to notice that some of my stuff wasn't in the same place as I thought I'd put it. It didn't scare me because I know I'm a distracted person. On the day of the incident, I was coming home earlier than usual with another student, Thomas, the boy that lives in the apartment next to mine. We got in and when I unlocked my door, I saw a woman inside my apartment. Of course, it scared me, but as I was about to ask her what the F she was doing here, she told me, Oh, sorry, I didn't know you'd be home this early. I'm the janitor, I clean the rooms weekly. She then smiled at me and went out. I didn't know we had a janitor, but this kind of explained why my stuff was moving. Thomas then noticed that she had left her keys on my desk and said that I should give them back to her. When I took a closer look, I just realized those were my lost keys. The night passed and I decided to talk to the man in charge of the complex about this. I told him about the janitor that had my lost keys so I didn't really lose them and I asked for my money back. He just looked at me in total incomprehension and told me, but we don't have a janitor. I just froze. Then who went into my apartment for the past few weeks? Why was she still there? We didn't call the police because nothing had been stolen, but I still searched for cameras in my apartment. You never know with these psychopaths. I haven't seen her since that, and I'm glad to know that she can't enter the complex anymore without a badge on the keys. The first job I had was at a pizza place in my hometown. It's a really small town with a little over a thousand people. We're right next to a main highway that's about 30 minutes away from a major city. One night at around September to October, I'm working with two other co-workers and our manager. Our whole shift has been pretty slow and we're just getting ready to close at 9pm. Around 8.30pm, two men and a little girl at around the age of 7 or 8 come in. I go up to the front and ask them if they need help with anything or if they're going to place an order. One of the men, the shorter one, says that they are just passing through and then asks about the prices of different items on the menu. He also asks what time we close. I answer and he just says okay and walks away to sit down with the little girl at a booth. 
The taller man then leaves the building and gets into their car parked out front. The smaller man gets up after about five minutes, whispers something to the little girl, then leaves. My coworkers and I are watching this all go down and talking about how strange it is. The little girl gets up and starts dancing around to the radio station we have playing. After a couple of minutes of this, I walk up to her and ask her if she's hungry or if she wants a drink. She says she only wants water, which I get for her. She takes it back to the booth and sits down. I ask her who she's waiting on and she says her dad. My coworkers and I are starting to get worried for her because the two men haven't come back yet and it's 8.50pm. We start to think that neither of one of them are her dad at all. My manager decides to call the police. Our town's too small for our own police station so we have to wait for them to come from the next town over which takes at least 15 minutes. I go to sit with her at the booth. I'm making small talk with her, trying to make sure she's safe and nothing happens before the cops can get there. In the middle of our conversation, she gets up and says she has to leave. My manager and I try to tell her she needs to stay in the restaurant until her dad comes back, but she starts crying and screaming and insists on leaving. A couple of days later, my manager said the cops found her walking down the road alone later that night. We never heard any more information about the situation afterwards. I just hope that she's safe now. I'm a 17-year-old male living in a relatively quiet life in rural northern Montana. I don't party a lot or do stupid stuff, but I do love driving in the mountains. Little did I know this could have cost me my life. It's August of this year, 2020, and I was enjoying some free time on my day off of work, and I decided to go take a drive in the mountains north of Kalispell. I drive a red Nissan Frontier straight out of the 90s with a super temperamental transmission for context. The drive there was really uneventful. Typical idiot drivers, big diesels, northern highway dreariness... It was a foggy, cold, rainy day, so I figured nobody would be in the mountains at this time and I would be all alone up there. When I pulled off the main road and up the mountainous dirt road, I felt normal, like nothing was wrong other than my stupid transmission. I am driving up the road for about two hours until I hit a peak and get out to take some pictures, something I usually do for memories. And nothing was really out of the ordinary and... It was silent other than the wind whistling through the trees and rain. I was truly alone. Until I got the feeling. You know that feeling you get in your core when someone or something is looking at you? I was just standing there motionless, listening to any noises that might alert me to someone's presence. But there was absolute stillness. I started slowly walking back to my truck when I heard a loud boom and a sound like you hear in those old western movies. My fight or flight was instantly in sixth gear and I sprinted back to my truck, started it and by the grace of God or some higher being was able to get it into first quickly and sped off. I found a spot big enough and turned the truck around and hauled as much butt as this little four banger could do back down the mountain road and onto the highway. I drove completely flat out down the highway to the nearest gas station where I stopped. I was pooping bricks at this point because... It wasn't hunting season. I didn't see or hear anyone else and there was no way I could be mistaken for an animal. I get out to see if the truck was damaged at all and lo and behold, there was a massive bullet hole. I'm going to guess a 7mm round size hole in the side of my truck. It went in by the rear fender and came out through the tailgate. I immediately called the county sheriff but since there was no bullet or evidence that they had done it, there wasn't much they could do. Nothing else has really happened since then and I haven't gone back to that area. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video and join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. 
and check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And may the bathroom fairy watch over all of you. Spinal.